Welcome to this week's lab on geologic time for Earth Science 1100. Before continuing with this presentation, make sure you've gone through the pre-lab reading. Earth is over 4.5 billion years old, so there's a lot of history to go through. The geologic time scale was created to break up this huge amount of time. The very first geologic time scale was developed in 1913 and has been updated by countless scientists over the last century and to this day whenever new information arises. There are two different approaches you can use when creating timelines in earth science. The first is absolute or radiometric dating, which involves putting a numerical age on something. This approach is based on the decay of radioactive elements, which has only been an available technology for a few decades. The second approach is relative age dating, which doesn't involve actual ages, rather involves comparative ages, where we can say something is older or younger than something else. Relative age dating has been used for centuries because it is based on principles instead of technology. We measure the passage of time based on the rates and rhythms at which regular changes occur. Great examples would be the ticking of a clock, alternating between day and night, or the seasons throughout the year. Dating rocks that are usually way older than any of us requires radiometric dating. Radiometric dating is based on the fact that radioactive isotopes decay at regular rates. An unstable radioactive element like uranium eventually decays to a more stable element like lead. In this case, the parent element would be uranium and the daughter would be lead. The radiometric clock starts once a particular mineral forms, where you have 100% of your starting parent isotope. A half-life is the time required for 50% of parent atoms to decay to an equal amount of daughter atoms. Once a mineral forms, you have 100% of your initial parent atoms because it is newly formed. After one half-life, 50% of those initial parent atoms have decayed into daughter atoms. However, after two half-lives, 50% of those parent atoms have decayed, meaning you have half of a half or one quarter of the initial parent atoms left. After about five to six half-lives, you've cut the number of initial parent atoms in half so many times that there are too few to measure accurately. Each radioactive isotope decays at its own rate, meaning different isotopes will have different half-lives. You can have atoms with half-lives of less than a second, to others with half-lives of over a billion years. The isotopes with longer half-lives can be used to date older things, whereas isotopes with shorter half-lives can be useful for dating younger things. For example, carbon-14 is really useful for dating things within the last 40,000 years and is used a lot in archaeology to date human bones at various sites. However, you wouldn't want to use carbon-14 to date dinosaur bones since they went extinct about 65 million years ago. Because they went extinct so long ago, there wouldn't be enough carbon-14 left in the bones to detect. Typically, we use the parent to daughter isotope ratios to calculate absolute ages. There are some example problems at the end of this presentation for you to try, but if you're stuck, you can always ask about them in office hours. Although having absolute ages for everything would be ideal, radiometric dating isn't perfect. Analyzing samples requires a lot of time, money, and people with the proper training to run the instruments. Samples might also be completely inaccessible. Lastly, not everything can be dated accurately. Sedimentary rocks in particular can't be dated this way since they're made of rocks that had formed long before the said rock formation existed. Different events, like folding or faulting of rocks, also can't be dated this way. This is where relative dating can become useful. Though there aren't exact ages, you can determine the order of events in a particular area. There are no fancy instruments required in relative dating, only basic principles of geology. This is also useful for any type of rock, as well as various geologic processes like folding and faulting. The first principle of relative age dating is the principle of original horizontality, which states that sedimentary layers and lava flows were originally deposited horizontally. If they're no longer flat, it means that they are deformed afterwards. The second is the principle of lateral continuity. When deposited, sedrock layers and lava flows extend laterally in all directions 
until they either thin to nothing or reach the edge of the basin that they're deposited in. If you see rock layers that are separated by a valley but otherwise look similar, you can assume they are the same layers. Next, we have the principle of superposition, which assumes that the oldest rock layers in an undisturbed sequence are on the bottom and the youngest layers are on top. This is the same concept as you putting a book on top of a table and then a pen on top of the book. The table had to be there for you to put the book on it and the book had to be there for you to put the pen on top. Cross-cutting relationships assume that any feature that cuts across a rock layer must be younger than what it cuts. If you ripped a piece of paper, the paper would have had to have been there first in order for you to be able to rip it. Lastly, we have the principle of inclusions, which states that any piece of rock that is included in another rock must be older than the rock into which it was included. Remember conglomerates from last week's rock lab? The pebbles in that conglomerate had to have existed in order for them to be included in the rock. In an ideal world, we would have a complete rock record from Earth's creation to the present day all over the world. However, plate tectonics, which you'll learn more about in one of next week's labs, causes rock layers to deform or be displaced. Erosion and weathering also eat away at the rock record, leaving gaps called unconformities. Unconformities can be caused by either erosion or just a lack of deposition. Though all unconformities represent gaps in the rock record, there are three main types. The first is a disconformity, which is an erosional surface between two parallel rock layers. The second type is a nonconformity, which is an erosional surface between layers of different rock types. Typically, these have older igneous or metamorphic rocks below, with younger sedimentary rock layers on top. The last type is an angular unconformity. As the name would suggest, this is an erosional surface between two sets of non-parallel rock layers. This type of unconformity occurs when one set of rock layers are deposited horizontally and subsequently tilted and eroded down. Eventually, a new set of rock layers are deposited on top. By using these principles, you should be able to determine the order of events in a geologic cross-section or a slice through the earth, like this one of the Grand Canyon. When determining the order of events, it's easiest to start with the oldest thing and move forward through time, rather than starting with the youngest layer and moving backwards. Due to the principle of superposition, the oldest should be at the bottom. In this cross-section, that would be formation K, since even though the bottom layers are tilted, we're assuming that nothing has been completely flipped upside down. The next formations in the sequence would be intrusion J, nonconformity S, formation M, and formation E, based on cross-cutting relationships, inclusions, and superposition. Try finishing this cross-section and then practicing the example problems at the end of this presentation. If you're still stuck, check out the additional videos for help and come ask about it in office hours.